Welcome to another episode of Dementia Dialogue, where you will hear my interview with Christine Thelker, author of a book, For This I Am Grateful, Living with Dementia. This is an unusually long episode, but instead of splitting it into two, we are leaving it up to you to decide if and when you need to interrupt, pause, and then resume. We begin with Christine reading from her book. Friday, June the 5th in 2015. This blog is to try to help me remember things, document things, in part to help with medical treatments and to help my family and friends as they try to support me. Yesterday, I needed medical attention, but was unable to seek it out. I'm not okay at these times. I cannot help me get what I need because my brain is on its own path while this is happening. Yesterday, I remember thinking I don't feel right. Then at some point, the thing that kept going through my head was, just keep moving, just keep moving. So I did. I ended up walking into town, stumbling, coordination off, vision off, my thoughts jumbled. I thought I should sit down and call 911, but I didn't. My brain couldn't get the thought and actions to go together. At one point, I thought, I'll just walk to the ambulance station. If I get there, they'll know what to do. Except that didn't happen either. Somehow, I ended up back home, and then what seems to be several hours disappeared. In fact, it could have been much shorter. In any case, that time is gone, no recollection. Not sure who I talked to or what about. Remember thinking, I should go to the hospital, then thinking, I will just rest, it will pass. Today, I woke up and thought, oh my God, I should have gone to the hospital. This is not good. I realized I needed somewhere to write what was happening, how I'm feeling and what's going on in my brain before, during, and if I can after those episodes. Also, I feel many emotions, have many thoughts facing a journey such as this. So to find a place to put it, bring in my niece, Tara. Thank you for setting this up, for being so willing to help me wade through the neuron forest. Every day, if I feel good, I'm doing what I can to enjoy this day, this hour, right now. And on days when I'm not feeling right, I rest. Giving into this has been a challenge I'm so used to multitasking, making decisions, taking care of others, it's hard to realize I'm not able to do it all, that it's okay to just be sometimes. I'm always ready for the worst, hoping for the best, hoping to tackle my bucket list, wondering if the neurologist can actually do anything, or am I just slipping away little by little? I have a lot of hard decisions coming up and wonder how I will wade through them when my brain is not what it was. Hello, Christine, and welcome back to Dementia Dialogue. For listeners who may not have heard, Christine contributed to our series on human rights and dementia. Today is our first episode in a multi-part series on the arts and dementia. Christine, you are the author of For This I Am Grateful, Living with Dementia. Congratulations on getting a book to press Few of us would ever attempt, but here you are. As I read your book, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have done so, I especially thought of the candor and humility and courage that you expressed in facing up to the realities of dementia, but not being overcome by them. I want to explore some of that journey with you today. The first... uh, thing that I thought of was the the idea of gratitude and grief. Beginning with the title, the theme of gratitude permeates your whole book. Yet at the same time, grief is always just around the corner. For some people, these might seem to be opposing concepts. What do you think about that kind of comment? Well, first, let me say thank you very much for having me back. I'm always happy to participate, and thank you for taking the time to read my book. You know, I thought a lot about, you know, this whole gratitude and grief going 
they actually sit hand in hand. You have to feel grief at some point in your life in order to fully understand what gratitude is and what being grateful is. Um, so I really do think they're not opposing. They're more connected. I think that for, for most people, um, you know, we find ourselves grieving some type of loss in, in our lives. Um, people with dementia are on a continuous train of loss. Uh, because the losses keep coming at us it, with, as our abilities change, as friendships, family relationships change. All of those things create losses in and of themselves. But at the same time, we can be grateful that as we lose abilities, we gain in other areas. Um, for example, I never drew or painted or do, did any of those things before my dementia. I can either look at the loss of what I was doing prior to, or I can be grateful for this new added piece of my life. So they're very intertwined. Right, right. So in some ways, I suppose, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of the idea of you know what what you've been able to accomplish or undertake uh, since you were diagnosed with dementia that was different than your previous life and i suppose some of that gratitude is just directed towards yourself in terms of you know having the the internal strength to be able to identify opportunities and take advantage of them or create opportunities even yeah and i and i think you're, you're right there, and we don't often give ourselves enough credit for the things that we still do manage to do because so much of our lives is focused on our losses instead of our gains. So we have to be able to internally take the win is what I call it. Everything that you do now that you may not have done before or it might be something you've done before but you've learned how to do it differently now because your abilities have changed that's a win you need to give yourself permission to be your own cheerleader and be grateful that you have the ability to still do that one of the, it kind of follows along the same idea is Another aspect of the book that I found particularly impressive or, or significant was the idea of taking care of yourself. In your book, you talk about the very real physical pain that you fe felt as a result of your cardiovascular condition. And I really appreciate that because I must say it's one of the first times where people with dementia have talked about that the visceral pain that can be felt. And you've had strokes, you've had a heart attack. And then you've also uh, experienced emotional pain in terms of the loss of your husband, some of your friends that seem to have drifted away as a result of your uh, diagnosis and changing life, your struggle with your driving and having to both lose your home at one point and also then uh, perhaps most more importantly, losing your car. So the way in which you shared that I thought was very impressive. But at the same time, you also uh, shared with us as readers the efforts that you've undertaken to take care of yourself. For example, the keto diet, which I thought was very interesting, uh, your regular walking and exercise, your anticipation of the inevitability of change and planning for it. It almost seems as though there's an internal mechanism within yourself to strive for balance in your life. And I'm wondering if you might comment on that idea of balance. I think in large part, my life was very out of balance before my dementia. You know, I focused after my husband passed away, 
I turned my focus to my career and I sort of put so much emphasis in that that I, I really didn't realize that I wasn't actually living, you know? Once I had my dementia, and of course your career disappears, and then like you say, was the having to uh, the, suffer the loss of my home and then the loss of my driving ability and, and my car. Through all of those things, I realized those are all things. My career is just a thing. You know, you often hear people say, well, you're just a number, they'll replace you if you're not there. And that's so true. And yet we spend our whole life pouring ourselves into our career. And I don't mean that we shouldn't give our career 100% when we're there, but that's where we should leave it every day. So I learned about the little simplistic things and really focused on finding that balance and learned to understand that I have more power and control than I realized I did. And by putting all of the nutritional and the exercise, and I don't mean I have to go to a gym every day, but I can get outside and go for a walk and breathe the fresh air every day. Those are all things, and I can look at the beautiful flowers and hear the birds singing. Those things feed your soul, and they bring you into a new balance. And it's a really nice place to be. That's interesting that it, you know, that the idea of balance or the pursuit of balance really came along with your dementia. Yes, yeah. because in the beginning, you're too lost to really put that into place. You know, six months or a year into it, those things start to sort of move into your awareness instead of all just the despair. You either have to be consumed by it or you have to walk with it and you have to try to take charge of it as best you can. And that's how you end up finding that balance. Yeah. I work hard at that every day. You know, yesterday I was taken by ambulance and I spent the day in the hospital. Wow. Uh, you know, having CT scans and all kinds of things going on and IVs running. And, and yet here I am today <laughs> doing this and I can be grateful for that. I can be grateful that all the things I do to keep my life in balance helps me live better for a longer period of time despite my dementia. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. These efforts give you more strength. Well, they do. They do. And even the doctors, you know, even the doctor, like yesterday, the, the doctor was like, I've never seen anybody who works so hard to push yourself through and beyond all of the time, yeah. you know. So they're willing to push themselves to try to assist me with that, yeah. right? You know, there I was laying there saying, you have to help me today because I've got to be ready for my interview tomorrow. <laughs> One of the uh, other thoughts I had, journaling, let's just keep with this idea of self-care and self-help, if you will. And journaling is usually a very private act. And I'm assuming, and you can correct me, that you started journaling as part of uh, an exercise to try and build your strength to wrestle with dementia. And then you went from, so I'm correct in that regard then, that that was kind of the initial motivation was just to talk to yourself in a sense. Yeah, trying to understand what was happening to me. Yeah. So then you took that journal and you started a blog. And in a sense, you opened yourself up to the eyes of strangers observing you and observing how you were living your life. And then from there, you kind of took another step in terms of, of going out, and that is to publish a book and to take some of that blog and to refine it and then to put it in book form. So you're probably reaching 
an even wider market, or perhaps a market where, at least for me, reading a book is still a much more reflective and intense experience than reading something on a computer. So it's a little bit more intimate in some ways than, than a blog. I'm wondering if you could tell me what was the motivation behind this increasingly public presence of Christine Thelker? Yeah, when, I, when I first started, you're absolutely right. I started it so I could try to figure out what was happening to me. You know, this wasn't the dementia I knew because the dementia I knew in my career working in dementia was end stage, late stage, final stage. So for me, it was like, what and what, what's happening to me? So it was about figuring that out and understanding it. And then it was about helping my doctors understand because they're not that versed in younger onset. And because between appointments, I would forget things to tell them. So it was a way I could just take it to them and they could see what was happening. So that assisted them in how to help me. And then from there, I had people say, you know, you should really share what's happening to you so that, you know, there's other people out there that are going through this, that really nobody talks about it. So I decided to put my blog out there. And from there, it just sort of took off. It was very scary. Sometimes it still is very scary because I had to make myself completely vulnerable. A lot of people can write books, but they do it sort of in the third party sense. They don't make themselves that vulnerable, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But in order to really be able to give people that true insight, I had to make the decision to be that vulnerable. It wasn't until the book actually was released when my publishers in New York called me to say the book will be on the shelves on June 30th. I was like, okay. And then when I had the, the my copies, they sent me a few copies, arrived in the mail, I sat on the floor with this little box of books, looking at them and thinking, oh no, what have I done? The whole world, you can't ever take it back forevermore. Your story is out there. But then I started getting letters and emails and messages from people in England and Australia and Singapore and all kinds and and, you know, across Canada and, and from the U.S. And, you know, some of them, uh, they stick in my mind still, you know, a lady telling me um, where she was from and, and that she had just read my book and uh, she had sat down and cried and she was so grateful that I was willing to put myself out there. She only wished that she had the book three years earlier because it helped her understand what her mother went through in a different light. Unfortunately, her mother died before the book came out. Uh, but it still brought her some peace because she had a different understanding. So when you hear those kinds of things, then that vulnerability is like, okay, it's okay. And it's still scary today be because you do subject yourself to people wanting to be critical, um, people thinking, well, you just did it for the glory. Um, you just want to be famous. I am not any of those things. <laughs> um, I just want to help people. Right. So, so the vulnerability comes with having that drive, I guess, or that purpose of, of wanting to help people. I, I read a uh, a piece in the in the uh, Guardian this morning. I was reading it. The introductory line was giving purpose to my pain. In some ways, that's you know that's exactly what you just said was too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. you make yourself vulnerable, um, and 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 in that 
you find the purpose and your purpose is then to share that and help other people. So, yes. so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that the book has been so well received and that sort of, when I have those moments of, you know, panicking about being so vulnerable, I go back to that. I go back to why, why, why did I allow myself to do that? And that gets me through that. Yeah. So there's a natural uh, connection then between your book publishing and the advocacy that you've undertaken over the last couple of years. And I was particularly um, impressed by the section of the book where you talk about your getting to know people through the Dementia Alliance International and the uh, camaraderie and mutual support that you've derived from that group. And I thought that was uh, really uh, terrific. And I'm just hoping that more and more people with dementia will are having opportunities to be able to meet with one another, uh, you know, in, in different settings, uh, because it seems to offer so much towards people. Um, when I think of advocacy, I thought of a uh, talk I heard many years ago now about four qualities of a successful advocate. And those were passion, purpose, partners, and perseverance. In my mind, your book reflects all four of these qualities. And there's even a section entitled Perseverance. We've just talked about purpose. Clearly, you've got passion. And I know that throughout the book, one of your other examples of gratitude are the people in your life. So you've got lots of partners. I'm wondering, though, when you look at those four gifts, is there one that you think stands out particularly strong in your particular life? Oh, yeah, they're all so important and they really are so entwined. I think for me, it's the passion. Without having that passion to really make a difference and help other people, I wouldn't be able to find that purpose. It wouldn't stay, you know, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't persevere through those hard days, those difficult days, and those challenging things we come up against trying to advocate. It's exhausting work. We don't do it for applause. We don't do it to have people running and thanking us. We do it to make a difference for other people. So I think the passion, and I hope that passion never leaves me, you know? I really hope that it never leaves me. And I, I love meeting other people who become passionate as well. Often they find that after their diagnosis, you know, and they meet some of the people like my partners, like with DAI and all the people globally I've met through them. And they're all so passionate, so passionate. So I think that's probably the piece. Yeah. I, there's no right answer to that question, but I can certainly uh, say that passion is one of the, uh, the uh, emotions or the, you know, the senses that permeates uh, your book. And I think it's, you know, the energy that, that you've devoted into achieving that balance that you mentioned, uh, the energy of, that you've put into your writing are all examples of that, uh, that kind of passion that you have, that you've been able to direct in such positive ways. That's a very uh, interesting insight into how to respond to a condition like dementia and to be able to marshal your resources and struggle with the disease, try to hold it at bay, if you will. You're to be admired for that. People with dementia are, are continuously having to reinvent themselves, what they do, how they do it. Um, it's a continuous, it's exhausting work trying to stay in step with your illness or one step ahead of it, you know, planning for 
how can I continue to look after myself for longer? So if I do this, this, and this, and I have those things in place, that alleviates. So people with dementia are on this continuous evolution where most people tend to get comfortable in their life. We don't have the ability to be comfortable anymore. Yeah, we've got to keep moving. Um, so one of the ways that you've moved is to bring art into your life. You paint, and you mentioned just a moment ago that you didn't paint until you had dementia, and I, I'm surprised to hear that. I, in fact, you designed the cover of your book, and that's, uh, you know, that's a real reflection of your capacity in that regard. You write, you blog. Blogging is more than writing. It's getting, you know, getting that blog onto the internet. I, I've noticed that you've got some artwork and photographs and things connected to it. So this all represents a certain amount of effort and talent. And then you're 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 speaking. You've spoken at the uh, in New York at the United Nations. You spoke at the uh, in Chicago at the uh, Alzheimer's Disease International, you have other speaking engagements. Speaking is a form of creativity as well. I'm wondering if you might comment about what you think art offers to a person with dementia. I think it is such an important outlet because we find these pieces of ourselves. Maybe there was some of that in me before, but my life was not in tune or in balance. So those creative things didn't emerge or maybe they weren't there at all. Maybe the changes in my brain have made me be more creative as a way to manage or cope. So for many of us, we have different forms, whether it's gardening, which is, can be an art form itself, whether it's photography, which I love to do, writing like I do, painting, sculpting. There's so many different avenues we can, we can go and it allows us to immerse ourselves in something and we sort of lose ourselves in that. We sort of put the dementia aside because we can be very focused on that and it's something that gives back to us a pot, something positive and and we feel good about what we're doing so it has so many levels of importance you know it reminds our, us that we still have capabilities so that goes back to what we talked about in the beginning it's it goes on the win column right where we can share for ourselves look at what i did yeah. Maybe I can't bake a loaf of bread anymore, but I can do this. Two words that came to my mind just as you were speaking was, one was liberating, a liberating kind of experience. Thank you. That's a great word. And the other word was feedback, kind of provides you with some feedback because you can sit back and look at your product and appreciate it for what it is. Perhaps you're not as satisfied as you would be, but then you can go on to to improve upon it. So it, it's, uh, it provides you with some immediate feedback. Well, and it gives us that purpose again too, doesn't it? Exactly. Everybody needs to have purpose. And if we can feel good about creating something, whatever that is, in whatever art form it is, just as we're having this conversation, something came to my mind, uh, kind of a conceptual model that I learned of years ago, and it's called the theory of the margin. But the idea is that we all have a load to carry, and we've got a certain amount of power. And sometimes your load might get heavier than your power. And there's two things you can do. You can either try and reduce the load or increase the power. And those are our two options. And I think I see that in your life where you've worked you know, with your healthcare providers and it paid attention to your health and that kind of thing to try and manage and limit your load while at the same time working with yourself to build up your power. It's another idea of the concept of balance. 
And I'm glad you brought that up because that's such a good analogy because with all the people globally that I meet with dementia, and if you look at the power they have to adjust their lives so that they can still feel purposeful, so that they can still have this power, so that they can still contribute and feel good about who they are. That's the perfect analogy for that, because that's exactly what they do every day. They adjust those loads. And some days you have to give in because some days the load is just too heavy. So you just have to retreat to your corner or your bed or whatever it is and be, okay, I can't function today. And you allow yourself permission to not function today. Maybe tomorrow or the next day you get back up and you shift that load again and you retake the power and you get out and you go for a walk or you do whatever that thing is that helps get you back into more of a balance. Yeah. So that's right. I'm glad that you shared that. I really like that. Well, I just want to say as we conclude that I am so appreciative of you making the effort uh, to get your book published and then to be available to have this conversation with me and to be available to so many of your, uh, if I might use the word, fans. Uh, <laughs> um, perhaps it's not appropriate, but maybe it is. Um, you might not be famous, but you've got some fans. So it's a way of people expressing their own appreciation uh, for the effort that you've made. And uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank you especially uh, for the uh, personal conversation that we've had today. Before we end this episode, let's listen to Christine one more time. So many things are different now. I didn't even realize until I started on the Aricept how in so many ways I was not managing as well as I had thought. For sure, I had friends around me who compensated for me, bless their hearts. My family and friends ensured that nothing totally devastating happened. I have come to the realization that if I am to write and try to help others along this journey, it is going to take some brutal honesty on my part. In a sense, it's like taking the mask off, being real, being vulnerable. If I'm honest, I can say it is at night or in the wee hours of the morning when my mind and body are at rest that I allow the fears to enter. Yes, I am afraid, terrified actually, Afraid of the day I can no longer take care of myself. Afraid of the day I have to give up driving. Afraid of ending up in care. I have decided that can't and won't happen. There are many times I wish I wasn't alone. I mean that in the sense of having a partner. The one who hugs you in the night when you have tears. The one you can take the mask off around. Then I realized that I also don't think I would have wanted him to endure this journey I am on now. I always hear people say, you are so lucky. No one to pick up after, no one to cook for, etc." Hmm, being alone is tough no matter how many great friends you have and I am truly blessed in that regard. But at the end of the day, I am still alone. That makes this journey more difficult. I'm not sure. Living with illness, no matter what type, is difficult. Most illnesses, however, allow us treatment plans, projected outcomes. This disease does not. It will inflict itself on my life at whatever pace it likes, in whatever way it likes. It has forever changed who I am. Oh, there are still parts of me that shine through on good days. On those days, the spunk, the sparkle are still there not with the same intensity, but they are there. The new medication has allowed for that and I'm grateful. So most days you see the me that smiles and says, I'm great or I'm fine because that's what I need to do to manage. But sometimes I have to be allowed to take the mask off. Check out our website for more information about how to purchase Christine's book. It would make an excellent Christmas present to a person who cares about dementia, so keep that in mind. 
Dementia Dialogue is offering a free copy of For This I Am Grateful to a person chosen at random. You can enter the contest by writing us at dementiadialogue at lakeheadu.ca and put grateful in the subject line. The name will be drawn on December 1st. Please subscribe to Dementia Dialogue on your favorite podcast platform or at our website, dementiadialogue.ca. Thank you for listening and take care.